Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the ODPP Cafe. My name is Anita Onuko. I must start by apologizing for starting late. We had planned to start at 8 a.m., but because of technological challenges that we had no control about, we are only able to start now. I am very sorry for this, and we hope to do it better next time. So once again, welcome to the ODPP Cafe. It's a show brought to you by the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution. And it's live on Facebook and on YouTube. And we'd like to invite you to, to, to join us. We invite you to subscribe and also invite your friends to watch us. We want to invite you to engage with us, ask your questions. Uh, we have visitors on the show. And we invite you to engage with them, ask questions, and, and you'll get the responses that, are, uh, that you need. So we are on YouTube, again, at the Office of Director of Public Prosecution. We are on Twitter at ODPP underscore KE. This show is meant to inform you, to educate you on matters concerning the law, different aspects of the law, because at any given point in time, we'll either be in conflict with the law or you'll be in contact with the law or someone close to you will need advice. And this is one show that will help you understand what to do in such instances. So thank you so much. Karibu sana. And let's get the show running. And of course, we'll get to answer to your comments and sample some of your comments at the end of the show. So as always, we begin with court cases and a sample of what has been happening at, uh, at, at the ODPP. A sample of court cases, not everything. And so I'm going to start with the trial of uh, lawyer Willie Kimani. The trial of four police officers and a civilian accused of the murder of uh, IJM lawyer Willie Kimani and uh, his client Joseph uh, Mwendwa and driver Joseph Moirori came to a close after five years and eight months. Both parties uh, were given a chance to highlight their final submissions, and the case came to an end. Justice Jesse Lassit told the parties that she will issue a judgment on notice within uh, 60 days. So the judge said she has 6,114 pages of documents to read, 117 exhibits and testimonies of 46 prosecution witnesses, and 34 defense witnesses that will guide in her decision making. So we wait for the, for the judgment from, uh, from the good judge on this case. It's been five years, and it has now come to an end. So back to our court cases. Uh, the first one is about Sharon Atieno, the Obado murder trial. He, the prosecution presented three witnesses um, in Sharon Atieno and her unborn baby murder trial. So Haron Jero, a clinician at Rachuonyo Hospital, testified that on the night of uh, September 2018, 3rd September 2018, OCS Kendu Bay Boniface Kamisi, together with five police officers, brought in a male patient. So this was the first prosecution witness, I believe. Uh, so three of them were presented uh, yesterday. So the patient informed him that he had jumped out of a moving vehicle after being abducted together with a female companion by people known to him. Police constables Oletunai Birgen, I hope, and Raymond Leselel testified that on the said night, they received calls from the OCS Kamisi to go to attend to a man who had reportedly been abducted and later rescued. The hearings continue on 7th, 9th, and 10th of March, 2022. So that's the Sharon Atieno murder trial. Sharon together with her unborn baby. The next case we highlight today is the NYS case, slated for February 21st. A Nairobi court directed at the money laundering case involving $791 million NYS candle uh, case against prime suspects Josephine Kafura, businessman Ben Gethy, and nine others should be mentioned on 21st of February. All the accused are currently out on, on cash bail of 300,000 and an alternative bond of a million shillings each. So this case will be mentioned on 21st February 2022. All the 11 accused have since denied 16 counts relating to transactions allegedly involved, involving the stolen funds. Uh, the prosecution uh, submitted that the accused are alleged to have committed the offense between December 2014 and 2015. So we get to, we'll get to know what happens after the mention on 21st of February. Uh, the next case is about Nathan Ndungo. He was released on a million bond and surety of a similar amount pending the receipt of the formal extradition request documents from Rwanda, from the Republic of Rwanda. Mr. Ndogo is wanted in Rwanda and is alleged to have been tried and convicted uh, to five years of imprisonment by a court in Rwanda in absentia. So Rwanda has uh, requested for his extradition and I believe that is work in progress. He's currently out on bond. 
So that is uh, the story of Nathan Dungo. Uh, he had been charged with the offense of selling a property belonging to another person. Uh, the court ordered the fugitive to deposit his travel documents in court. He was also ordered to be reporting to the DCI and the Transnational Organized Crime Unit every Tuesday and Friday. Uh, like we said, when we talked about bail and bond, it comes with some conditionalities and looks like those were his conditions for this one. And then this one is about the ODPP. Uh, this week, uh, the DPP, Nurin Haji, was appointed the vice chair of the National Council on the Administration of Justice, NCAJ. There was a council meeting this week where he was appointed the vice chair. Uh, the DPP in his speech loaded the Uadilifu case management system, which is currently integrated with the judiciary's e-filing system. They were talking a lot about technology then and how to automate the criminal justice system. So this has enabled prosecutors to file court documents directly to the judiciary. And he also applauded the IG for digitizing their occurrence book. The OB is now digital, I believe. And we'll get to know about that later. The chief guest was the Honorable Lady Justice Martha Kome. She acknowledged the role of technology in promoting efficiency in court cases. She appreciated the NCAJ members for working towards digitizing their operations. And as the chair of, she's the chair of the NCAJ, she assured them of, uh, of her support. And finally, I think uh, the, we, the trial of Kianjakoma brother murder trial uh, started. The first witness in the murder of the two brothers, Emmanuel Ndwiga and Benson Ndwiga, in, Kianja, in Kianjakoma, took to the stand. John Jeru told the court that, uh, John Jeru told the court that, uh, I've lost that, sorry, give me a minute. So John Jeru told the court that on August 1st last year, he together with a friend, Chris Dunn, met up with the two brothers at a PlayStation shop in Kianjakoma. So this possibly is uh, what happened way before, before the, the, the event, the, the murder took place. Njeru said that the four then went for a night out at the Mwamori Club and around 10 p.m. as they left the club, they were accosted by two policemen dressed in civilian clothes. The two brothers were arrested as they tried to flee the scene and from a distance, Njeru could hear sounds of someone, of like someone was being beaten. The hearing continues on 3rd of March, 9th May and 16th May 2022. So that is in as far as the highlights we wanted to share with you today from the courts. And of course, some of those things uh, that happened at the ODPP. Uh, this week saw so the DPP appointed vice chair of the NCAJ. And of course, there's a lot of discussion about uh, automation of the criminal justice system. The ODPP has Wadilifu, the judiciary has theirs, and now the police are digitizing, digitizing their OB. And this is meant to enhance access to justice. But for today, and as you've seen in our social media platforms, we've been talking about FGM, uh, zero tolerance towards FGM. Uh, the world was marking on Sunday, February 6th, a day to mark the zero tolerance towards FGM. In Kenya, we had said there was a commitment to end FGM by 2022, but we are in 2022 and we are not yet there. So there's so much work going on in the background to ensure that we eradicate uh, FGM. So we've shared a few posts with you on Facebook and on Twitter, and today we want to discuss it. I, as we had put on our Facebook, we were to have three visitors. One of them was uh, from the organization that, uh, that works with men who want to end FGM. But because, again, of the tech issues we faced, we, could not, we were not able to host him. Uh, Mr. Uh, Peter Kemei, I know he's watching and definitely will be able to answer any questions you may have about uh, how the role of men in ending FGM. But for the show and for the studio today, I have two uh, patient ladies. And I'm very sorry for starting late, ladies. Yes, and I want to give them a chance to introduce themselves so that you can get on the, with the discussion. I'll start with you, Malawa. So, my name is Malawa Enemais, and I'm a student at Kenyatta University. Yeah, doing STEM technology and data arts. Okay. Yeah. And you're here because you're an anti FGM champion? Yeah, sure. I'm okay. an anti FGM champion, and I'm also like work, working with the uh, Maasai cricket ladies in uh, eradicating the retrogressive part of our culture in the mm -hmm. Maasai community. Okay. Yeah. Karibu sana to the show and thank you for your patience. Thank you. Yes. Karibu, madam. Karibu, please introduce yourself and tell us what you do. Thank you. Yeah. My name is Naomi mm -hmm. Atina. I'm a prosecutor in the FGM unit mm -hmm. in the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution. Okay. So you tell us about the legal framework and the progress in that? Of course, the SOPs that you launched recently. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
we have um, different categories of uh, legal framework. Uh -huh. Yeah, we start with the national laws. Yeah. Because we have the national laws, we have international laws and regional uh, instruments. Yes. I will start with the national laws, of course our constitution. Yes. Then we have the prohibition against FGM mm. Act mm. 2011. Mm. We have the Children Act. We have the Penal Code. We have the Court. And um, we have some uh, statutes which uh, provide for not only uh, prohibition of FGM but related offense. Like mm. now, um, we have the we um, have the Children Act yeah. that not talk, uh, not the Children Act, uh, but the Special Offences Act. Yeah. That's not provide for eradication of FGM, but it talks about other offences mm -hmm. which can come, which, ca which relates to FGM. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, when we were talking about a, a girl who has been circumcised and then eventually uh, we get her married off, mm -hmm. then we can charge her for defilement or rape. Or under the sexual? Under the sexual offenses. Okay, act. okay. So, so the, these other acts do not really talk about, uh, okay. they do not prohibit FGM, but they talk about or prohibit other, provide for other related offenses. Mm -hmm. um, when we go to the regional, um, if we go to the regional, whatever, regional instruments, that's a number. Yeah. Maybe I can also mention a few of them. Yes. Uh, we have um, the African Youth Charter. Mm -hmm. We have um, African Charter on the Rights of and Welfare mm -hmm. of a Child. We have the Protocol of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights mm -hmm. on the Rights of Women. It's called uh, the Mabuto Protocol mm -hmm. for short. Mm -hmm. I can also mention a few of um, international instruments. Maybe I'll start with the United Nations International Conference on not, uh, that's United Nations International Conference on Population Development. Um, that's um, it's, um, so it's a commitment okay. to zero sexual and gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. We can talk about um, the Convention Against Torture. Mm -hmm and other cruel and inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. We can talk about the United Nations Convention on the Rights of a Child. I think it's very critical. Yeah. The Convention on, on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. There is also a declaration on the elimination of violence against women. Okay. Just to m mention a few, yes. of course, uh, I can also mention the Universal, universal Declaration of human rights. So yes. FGM is a violation of human rights? Yes, it FGM is. FGM is a sexual, uh, an gender-based gender gender based violence. violence against FGM is, um, the, is this discrimination again in FGM? Yes, it does. G does? It does. It's or it discriminates does. I thought something like well. an acronym for something. So how do you define FGM? What is FGM then? Um, FGM is um, total or partial removal of the fiscal, uh, the external genitalia of a, a woman or a girl. Mm. Yes. Okay. And um, we have different types of FGM. Yeah. We have um, type 1, which is, um, I can call it um, clitoridectomy. Yeah. It involves removal of partial yeah. or total removal of the clitoris. Yeah or the prepuce. Um, we, we also have type two, which is also called excision. Uh, this one also involves partial or total removal of the clitoris or the prepuce, but it also involves removal, partial or total removal of the um, lapia minora. Yeah. Um, with or without excision of uh, the lapia majora. Mm -hmm. And then we have type 3, which involves now infibulation. Okay. With infibulation, it involves narrowing of the vaginal orifice with the creation of uh, a covering seal. Mm. We also have type 4. It's not common as such, but it is there. It in involves breaking, putting an ornament, like a ring. Oh. 
uh, putting some people put some chemicals in just in too narrow to change the oh. so there's so many things which are put then which one is most common in Kenya uh, in Kenya I can say almost all of the okay the type 4 is not common but type 1 it is type 2 and type 3 okay now type 4 it's so hard for somebody even to um, to realize or to discover somebody's because uh, some some of those things is you itself you can do it yourself. yourself. Like now if you go and put an on a metal ring, mm -hmm. it's so difficult for anybody yeah, else to even report. But if somebody puts it on you, that's an offense. It's an offense. Okay. Even putting it on yourself, it's an offense. Oh. But it's, I'm saying it's, it's not that common. Okay. Remember there are other communities which also, it also involves even pulling of the clitoris. Yeah. Eh, it has so many dimensions. Yeah, <laughs> but that's now type four. Okay. All right, Malawa. Yes. Can you go to the show once again? Thank you. And we just want to know your story. Yeah. And first of all, before you start, why? What are the reasons given mm -hmm. in your community for mm -hmm. FGM? So the reasons given is that uh, a man, uh, like FGM, is a rite of passage from childhood to adulthood for a girl. So it's you have to undergo FGM for you to be respected, for you to be noticed as an adult in our community. Okay. So, for example, the other reason is that uh, men are not allowed to marry and cut girls. So, if you're a man in the Maasai community, you definitely know that you'll have to marry a girl who has undergone FGM. So, if you have not undergone FGM as a girl in the community, you'll not be respected. You'll be viewed as imma immature in the community and as an outcast in the community. Yeah. So, yeah. is there like a mark? How do you know you're marrying a, a cut girl? Is there an identifier? News spread <laughs> and people will know your family. If you have not undergone FGM, people will know yeah. because people will be talking about it and this is just a village or a community. Yeah. So people will definitely know. Yeah. Yeah. And just for clarity, you haven't gone and, uh, undergone FGM? No, I haven't. Now you tell <laughs> us your story. How did you survive that? So, uh, first of all, uh, let me just say that all I have four sisters yeah. and four brothers. So all my three, four sisters have undergone FGM yeah. and I am the only one who has survived who has not yes. undergone FGM. So actually, oh, are you the <laughs> <laughs> it's because actually I am the last one and I got the chance that um, the Maasai there was uh, cricket was introduced in our village mm -hmm. and, and hence uh, uh, the Maasai cricket warriors was formed mm -hmm. of which uh, my brothers were involved in it okay. uh, from back then when we were in primary school. So that is years later when uh, cricket was introduced that they got to form the Maasai Cricket Warriors. So they made it to, like, uh, to be as a form of ending the retrogressive part of our uh -huh. culture, like the early marriages, the FGM, and also empowering the culture in the society. Mm -hmm. So growing up, seeing what my brothers are doing, mm -hmm. it really empowered me, and I didn't want the same to happen to me like my sisters. So, uh, and also like seeing the girls undergoing the cut. You know, in the Maasai community, when um, the girl is being cut, you are expected to go and watch. Oh, it's a public event? Yeah, it's a public event. It's done like outside your door. So it, like the, the other girls are expected to go and watch. I learned something. So it was today. really, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it was really painful. And you know, these girls are even sometimes taken without their consent. So it was really so heartbreaking and uh, traumatizing for yeah. me. So later on, uh, in 2013, when my brother founded the Massa Cricket Ladies, uh, we also got our voice for our, okay. for us ourselves as girls to fight for our rights as girls. Yeah. So I got to be one of the members in the team, yeah. and I'm the captain of the Massa Cricket oh, Ladies. Nice. <laughs> yeah, so I got the chance to fight for myself as well as the other girls in the community. Yeah. So yeah. So you, you said, said no, or someone said no on your behalf? At first, I was depressed because I didn't want the same. You know, in the Maasai community, after you undergo the cut, you have to be given out. Because people oh. will be viewing you as mature, and men will be wanting ready for to, marriage. Yeah, men will be wanting or coming for proposals and such. So at how first, young, how I young, did, what is the age, the minimum age? Like, how young are these people, these girls who go for marriage? It can start from 12 
mm. and on, yeah. let's say from 12. Yeah. So like see how the girls were going through in the community, what was happening to them, their lives sh are shattering and then they don't have, you know, for me, I had an insight of how I wanted my life to be. Yeah. I didn't want the same life as my sisters who were taken out of school, cut and then given out. I didn't want the same to happen to me. So, I, I, okay, it started with me not wanting to undergo the cut, but again, I got the support from my brothers because oh. they formed the Masai Cricket Warriors who were fighting for the girls' rights in the community. Yeah. So yes, I got the support from my brothers, but then again, we formed the Masai Cricket Ladies, oh, which was voice. founded by my brother. Yeah. So yeah, we got the chance to fight for our rights also. So your father agreed not to? Finally. <laughs> <laughs> he finally agreed. Yeah. Otherwise, he made so many mistakes earlier. I, I don't yeah. blame him because it was the culture. Yeah. And he didn't know what he was doing, but at least he made something right. <laughs> yeah, definitely. There's always a chance to make things right. Yeah. Wow. That's quite interesting then. I mean, yeah. So you're viewed as not, if you go to where culture is practiced in Maasai, you're not viewed as an adult? I am still a child. I'm very old, <laughs> don't look at my face, <laughs> yeah. but I'm very old, yeah. but I'm still viewed as a child in my community. But are things changing now? Yes, definitely they are changing because like my dad and the rest, uh, we talk to them, we yeah. come, we gather the men, we talk to them, we gather the girls, we talk to them, and they are really changing because now my dad and my nieces, they have not undergone FGM, oh. so something really is happening. Oh, good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, so Madam, now may you, ODPP launched uh, standard op operating procedures for this, um, for anti-FGM. What are they meant to achieve? Um, the... SOPs was they are supposed first to uh, standardize the way we prosecute uh, FGM cases to give consistency mm -hmm. so that whoever one person who is um, maybe prosecuting in Kissing, another one in Mars, we have the same way of handling the victims, the same way of um, making a decision to charge. So it's the first, the main objective was to standardize mm -hmm. and uh, give consistency on how we handle. It. Um, FGM cases. Yeah. Um, through that, of course, now we will, and, and the, when we disseminate the SOPs and train, we will um, also uh, improve the skills of the prosecutors, mm -hmm. enhance the skills of the investigating officers, mm -hmm. because in our SOPs we talk about many things, mm -hmm. from how to, from investigations, how to, how to help in um, prosecutor-guided investigations, yeah. how to make a decision to charge, and uh, we also talk about how to handle victims of yeah. FGM mm -hmm. through to how to pick the yeah. best uh, offense and which offenses are there under the anti-FGM offenses mm -hmm. and other related from other related uh, statutes. Mm -hmm. So we intend to Number one, enhance skills of the prosecutors and even the police. And oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. I I was shocked that there are, there are the, the, the hot spots in Kenya are quite many. I used to imagine that it's just the Maasai, the Kisi, okay. and the Kuria. But now I'm learning that like over 22 in yes. Kenya. Do you know this area? Like, I can I can mention a few because yeah. there are 22. Yeah. Some of, um, as you say, those there are 22 hot spot counties. Yeah. Uh, like 22 counties in this country which mm -hmm. practice FGM. FGM. Yes. Okay. I'll uh, start with Mar um, we have Marsabit, we have Samburu, oh, yeah. we have um, West Pokot, we have Kisi, we have Nyamira, we have uh, Migori, we have Narok, Bomet, um, we have um, Kericho. Oh, I think that the problem is, I was looking at it from tribes. Because hmm. if, if we do tribes, it won't be 22, right? Mm -hmm. It will just be a few. Because now if you look at Bomet, Kericho. Yeah, we have Baringo. Yeah, the same. So yeah. we are not looking at tribes, but hotspot counties. Hot counties. 22 yeah. hotspot counties. Yeah. So that's Which one is the most notorious? You are going to ask my name. So we can talk to Skia. Kajado. Kajado. Yeah, yeah. Course, yeah, I was yeah. going to mention Kajado. She has mentioned it. Yeah. Well, but I don't think that it's one which is so notorious. But yeah. All the 22 hotspot counties, they really need a lot of work, they need yeah. a lot of uh, training, yeah. the addition of awareness. Um, because this 
uh, 22 hotspot counties, they practice different types of FGM. Yeah. Like now, if I single out the cases, you know, they do type 1. And also, take one was which one? You know, we are talking to people who maybe have lost the, the chat or <laughs> the video where you talked about chat. Type 1. Type 1, where it's where you remove partial or total removal of the clitoris and the clitoris. That's type 1. That's type 1. And what is the reason? Why do they do that? Is it just culture? Uh, some some communities say it's, okay, it's, but it's culture. Some, they say it's a rite of passage. They want to, they say a woman who is not who's and cut is still a child, as she said. Yeah. There's also an issue that when you are uh, uncut, you are uh, promiscuous, ah. you are clean, you are, and so many other reasons, depending from one community yeah. to another. Yeah. So, um, different um, communities uh, practice different types of FGM, like yeah. I said, the KC2 type 1. Yeah. We have the masses who do type, uh, they used to do type, type 3, but type they moved to type 3 is now the one which you remove the, it involves removal of the, the clitoris, the... It's not infibulation. It's infibulation. Oh, it's infibulation. Yes. It's the worst form. It's the worst form. But it also involves removing all those or without removing them. Then you either see tap or you put Can we pose and see girls are one whole and beautiful? It's not this. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it should be the, the slogan for anti FGM. Girls are born whole and beautiful. Stop yes. this. You know? Because it sounds yeah. really bad. Definitely. Yeah. It sounds really. It's, it's not only sounds it really is bad, bad yeah. but it's bad. Yeah. Remember, there's also some side effects. And let's talk a, a bit Com about and that. And complications. Yeah, what, what are those health, the side effects for FGM? Because somebody will argue that it has been in culture, it is going to stay because it is our tradition. But what have you seen are the health impact, the health effects of this thing? Uh, even though I'm not an expert, yeah. but from the training and, yes. uh, you know, we work together with other agencies like the Ministry of Health. Yeah. The short-term and long-term um, complications. Yeah. For example, if it's a girl who, you, who has gone through FGM, can have issues with giving birth during childbirth, depending on the type of um, FGM she went through. It can also be uh, getting uh, infections, like uh, urinary tract infections. Yeah. Remember also, it can also spread other sexual sexual transmitted diseases like um, uh, AIDS. If somebody oh, uses because the, the, the instrument or, being used to cut to cut, and the healing process may not be clean. Yeah, mm. there are, there are people who develop what they call keloids. You know, keloids like, mean? Uh, maybe <laughs> it's um, it's a kind of a fresh like a tissue which forms. Uh, well, exactly, you're fresh... telling me like when you pierce your ear yeah, they and it, it fails to heal properly, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. I can do to care that I knew you described it better than me. <laughs> so, so that grows, do yeah, in, uh, in your um, private parts, yeah. How then, of course, sometimes during the healing process, like now for type 3 infibulation, the, the, the scars can heal, and then you don't have a uh, it's so difficult for outlet to pass your periods or even you during urination so you they urinate and uh, some urine remains of course yeah. now that will that can every day she has um urinary tract whatever yeah. infections yeah. if you can't you can't pass your your periods or your menstruation yeah. you cannot menstruate like any other woman normally yeah. then you retain yeah. then of course that will bring other many complications. Can I ask you to tell that story you're telling us before we started? Uh, which one was the this? one about a case you handled about a woman who did not, who was not married, and it is her nephew. No, it, who, it, yeah. it wasn't a case I handled. Mm. It's a case somebody told us a oh, case okay. of a, an aunt who was um who was like an outcast because she was not married, and everybody was used to fear this lady. Yeah. Um, what we are told is that this lady, when she, went, when she was going through FGM, um, she developed the akiloid. The, the, the nundu. Nundu. <laughs> the kinundu you are talking about. Yeah, the growth. The growth. growth right? yes. Yeah, so when she deformed that kinundu or the growth, the growth in her dental, mm -hmm. then of course she will not uh, live a normal life. Yeah. Imagine when now she got married, the husband was like, oh my god, mm -hmm. what is this? Yeah. A, a, it's always a big thing covering yes. the mm. orifice of the the, the vaginal orifice. Yeah. 
so she was returned back to a village mm. and then of course she get she got married again the same thing happened to her did then, she know what was happening to her of course it's uh we are talking about our lady who is now in her 60s yeah of course she knew but she was not able to talk about this oh, yes. most in these most communities we people don't talk about fgm it's a topic which people don't sit down and now start talking about the side effects yeah. and whatever it's yeah. something you which is from about to talk about uh, gentle organs so she yes. did not share it to uh, with anybody mm -hmm. but a few people maybe those who are close to her knew what they was knew. happening yeah. but uh, imagine of uh, when you get married and your husband sees this for the first time, she has never heard of what happens in mm -hmm. FGM. She knows people go through FGM. Mm -hmm. Of course, she say, no, I want to have this lady as my wife. Mm -hmm. So she went back home. She will not give birth, of course, because she was not married mm -hmm. and because of the yeah. complications she was going through. Until a an, an nephew, who is now a doctor, heard of the story or what was happening to the aunt mm -hmm. and now helped her to go through a reconstruction surgery yeah. and it was too late because now she was over 50 Beyond after, her bearing age. after menopause mm. it's a sad story it it's also touched me as a yeah a lady yeah yes okay that's that's quite sad uh, i don't think i'll forget that soon especially the, the growth mm. so ADP, odpp is in 47 counties or in eight regions in the country the the anti-fgm unit or is it in the hotspots um we start with the hotspot um, counties, counties yeah. but we are in all you know all the in all counties for seven, yes. for seven counties yes. mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes we fgm is not only in those 22 hotspot counties okay. only mm -hmm. we have fgm in other counties actually even counties which you do not which have communities which you do not um practice a fgm imagine like nairobi oh yes uh maybe for example somebody from migori you take your child from Nairobi during the holidays, maybe December holidays, yeah. take that girl to Migori or Kehanja, wherever mm -hmm. she goes through FDM, and then you bring that girl back, back to Nairobi. Nairobi. So we not stop from charging you because it's not an hotspot yeah, count. Yeah, so yeah. we FDM, we have prosecutors in all the 47 counties. Yes. We have over 50 prosecutors. Our target was when uh, we were forming these specialist units, and we want to train the prosecutors. Mm -hmm. So that they know how to handle these FDM cases. Yeah. Uh, remember, even the police officers, most people do not know what FDM entails. Some people are hearing the first time of about three types of FDM. Some of us we think FDM is FDM. Yes. Even if you come from a community which probably practice FDM, as she says, maybe she thought what the masters do and what she knows is the only type of FDM. Yeah. Or somebody who comes from a community which does not practice FDM, she doesn't know what it is in the first place. Mm. So we need to train the prosecutor, capacity yeah. building. It also needs to, uh, to train the police, mm -hmm. the other agencies, yeah. the Ministry of Health. Mm -hmm. Because for a successful um, conviction yeah. of um, FDM case, we need to have properly investigated cases, mm -hmm. uh, documents, like medical documents, properly filled. Yeah. If the medical practitioner does not even understand what is FGM, FGM, what are the types of FGM, maybe she has seen only one type of FGM and then she's wondering, is this really FGM? Maybe she's used to, maybe she, was, mm. she has been working in a community yeah. which practice type 2. Yeah. Now she's seeing type 3 and she's like, oh, this what is different. Is, yeah, is this really FGM? So she, they're not sure what to feel. Yeah. Uh, we have had issues where we find somebody has gone through FDM, we have a P3 form which is not properly filled because the medical practitioner do not understand what they were seeing yeah. there. So she said or he said that's Something different. Assault, for example, oh, on uh, the so that changes from the circles whole case. and then say um, the instrument used is a sharp object. So when you go to court, of course, the defense will dwell on that and try to rely on that, that this is not oh, FDM, this okay, is assault. Okay, okay. Even the P3 talks about assault. Yeah. So, you can't so we are talking about different things. So we need proper training, capacity building from the Ministry of Health, the police, even us as protect, prosecutors. prosecutors. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay, okay. So and we also hope that our SOPs will so will also help us to kind of train. Mm -hmm. Uh, prosecutors and uh, the other agencies, okay. other agencies, I mean. Which is that one county that when you hear 
you won't be shocked that FGM is the what which can county holds the highest number of FGM cases? Uh from uh, the last um I don't know whether you want me to use the office data or what other institutions are talking Whichever about. Data, yeah. They say the cases have the highest number of uh, Oh really? Yes, it was eighty yeah. percent. I don't know whether that's true because that's data from here or from other agencies? It is it's from the Ministry of Health. Oh, okay. Yes. I would imagine it's mainly wow. uh, northeastern, Garissa and Wajia. Uh, I, I will not comment much yeah. on that, yeah. but again, remember the cases also practice medicalized FGM. Yes. They do it on very young children between uh, maybe zero. Not zero. <laughs> <laughs> Around because I come from that yes, community yes, myself, yeah. I know it's from five, six, seven years, even okay. four years old. Yeah. You know, those are very young girls, and since it's medical, it's FGM, it's done in secrecy. You may need to actually define a little for the person listening to us today what medicalized FGM is. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, medical FGM is F uh, it's a type, you know, it's a type of FGM. It's when uh, the, the, the FGM itself, the cut, is done by a medical practitioner. Practitioner that involves a doctor. Yeah. We have a clinical officers and nurses and midwives. Yeah. But we are told like uh, in communities like cases, it's actually it's mostly done by retired nurses and midwives. Wow. But mm, medical FGM can be done by anybody in the medical, yeah, in the uh, medical field. field. Wow. And there is an argument that sometimes in the health centers and uh, dispensers, there's somebody who always is there to assist, I don't know whether they're called a nurse or whatever, they sometimes even them also uh, do that, the cutting. Yeah, I read also in Taita, the, it's quite prevalent, that medicalized FGM, and it's done to very, for two newborns. Yes. So you go home with your child already nicked or cut. So that is like a type, what have you type one? That's still type mm -hmm. one. Type one. Yes. Wow. Ah, okay. So Malawa, you are the millennial in this space. Yes. Masome me wasaidia mabado wanataka tu vimenua cut. Ah, it really depends with your own perspective. Like for someone, for example, the youths when they're studying. So you as an individual, it really depends on you. But still there's that uh, thinking that after school I still have to go to the village. Yeah. And maybe my wife to be accepted in the society you know so it's tough it's tough because they really have to make a tough decision on if they Culture want the girls or, to be yeah. cut or yeah. they want the uncut girls so yeah. it really depends so but if, if, if just from from my perspective mm -hmm. it looks like men should lead this campaign against a German it's quite sad we didn't have Kemei on the show yeah but um what do you tell them for example during what what happens during mm -hmm. a cricket much oh so so we gather people together for example we go to the schools and then we play with the kids and then afterwards we teach them on the uh, effects of fgm and the uh, early marriages and we empower the girls or we just go to the different centers and then when we are playing you know cricket is not a uh, a very famous game in Kenya mm, no, it's not. so people will be wanting to see and to watch and see which mm. kind of game is this so they will come and join playing or others will come and watch so mm. we'll just take that opportunity to talk to them about the problems happening in our community okay. like FGM okay yeah. so do you is there is, do you have successes are you getting are you making progress yes we are making progress because girls are listening girls are getting empowered mm -hmm. And um, yeah, the cases like in my community, they are reducing. Mm -hmm. And now when you undergo like FGM, when you try to cut your girl, you'll be reported and you'll be oh, yeah. imprisoned. Yeah. So it's really happening. It's helping. But you know, it also depends on your own decision as mm -hmm. a girl, mm -hmm. because others will still be sticking to the community as culturally and stuff. Yeah. So it really depends also on you. Oh, OK. But it's really helping. It is helping. Yeah. And the mothers and the fathers? Because you know, helping. imagine a 12 year old going home to say, Minister. <laughs> it's helping because we also refused. So it's helping. But you know, like other girls, like even when you go undergo like the trainings, we teach them, st there are still others who will go to get cut. Yeah. Or they, it will be like their own decision to be cut. Yeah. So you can't force someone. You can't really force someone unless the government does. Yeah, but the <laughs> government say you can't even cut yourself. 
You can't um, make the decision to cut yourself. As I said that mm -hmm. we have so many the, the legal framework mm -hmm. from the international, regional, and the national legal framework. Mm -hmm. Our constitution itself mm -hmm. prohibits FGM. Yeah. We have the, the prohibition of FGM Act 2011, yeah. which prohibits FGM. Mm -hmm. It involves it, it. It has a number of um, offenses, which involves even procuring a FGM on yourself. Oh. So the government has already stopped. Even being don't cutting try. yourself. Yeah, mm, yeah, don't try. <laughs> yes, yeah. and uh, even forcing somebody to go through FGM mm -hmm. uh, using derogatory or abusive words against somebody. You know, that's uh, something also which makes somebody to go through FGM. Hate speech. So, does it fall under hate speech? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's an offense under FGM and the oh. prohibition of uh, FGM Act. Yeah, like imagine, I'm just thinking right now, if I'm campaigning, say, in Kisi, mm. and somebody says, Shuka wewe or Jakato. Can yep. I report that person? It's an offense under FGM Act. Okay. Yes. Wow. So then even medical is FGM, it's an offense under FGM Act. Okay. So we have so many offenses under Are you FGM talking to Act? these um, doctors and nurses? I mean, after going through school like that, you worked, you're retired. Why would you want to go and do this on, on a child? Uh, from, I think after the president's um, Commitments to end FTM 2022. We have seen a lot of efforts yeah. by the government, the anti FTM board, are creating awareness, and even the ministry is not behind. Mm -hmm. I cannot speak on the, on behalf of the ministry, yeah, but I, I know some efforts because yeah. we sometimes we have served, uh, work, workshop, workshops together, mm -hmm. we have other activities together and functions. Mm -hmm. uh, what I know for sure is nobody goes to a medical school and uh, they are trained on how to cut, yeah, no to, one. Do, to yeah. do circumcision. Yeah. And uh, there's no, in the, um, in the curriculum, there's nothing like that. So it's just a person. It's traditional. Yeah, not really. It's not. epic. It's about your personal oh, yes, 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 yes. Because I guess uh, people who are, do not come from such communities, mm -hmm who practice FGM but they still do cut scars mm -hmm. or practice medical FGM yeah. by cutting. Yeah. And because they are nurses, maybe you are working in a community which practice medical FGM and somebody comes and tells you, I'm going to pay you. Because you want that money, you, you do, do FGM. Yeah. So the the last thing I heard about the ministry saying they were trying to incorporate some of this into their curriculum, saying yeah. it's uh, unethical. Yeah and uh, the policies are coming up with policies mm -hmm. and the training manuals yeah. for the doctors mm -hmm. yes i said i'm not talking on yeah, yes, but yes. i'm aware of that, aware of that yeah. so we many many uh, government institutions are coming out to yeah. uh, assist in the fight against fdm FGM. including our office of yes. course okay. including their own dpp yeah so mala what are the rites of passage um that are not what do you, what what happens if you don't go through fgm do, are there other rites of passage you go through uh, we used to have, uh, nowadays we have the trainings, for example, from AMREF, mm -hmm. where you get like the girls are trained. I underwent the training when I was young, mm -hmm. but... Seems like you have to <laughs> grow so fast because you were the last one. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. underwent the training when I was young, where like, you know, they we have the shukas that they want to yeah. after you undergo FGM in the Maasai community. It's either a black shuka or a green shuka. So they give you the shuka and now like they, they bring together many girls and they train you and they, they empower you, they train you on the effects of FGM, they teach you on early marriages and everything that is happening in the society. Mm -hmm. And now you are initiated to like, you are now Ready. You're not initiated you are into womanhood to get married. Yeah, <laughs> it's not like you are cut, but yeah. it's like a symbol of FGM. Mm. So after the training, you are given a certificate, and now you're, you're so like. Are there you're... husbands who accept these certificates? <laughs> As I said, it really <laughs> depends on you. I'm just imagining <laughs> your age mates. Yeah, boys, your men, okay, young men your age. Mm -hmm. Do they recognize these alternative rites of passage? Nowadays, it really depends on your own perspective as an individual because others are learned and they understand and they want to understand and they want to be like open minded yeah. and they want to understand on the effects of FGM, but yeah. others are still rigid about their culture and their practice. Yeah. So it really depends on you yourself, but mostly yeah, a lot is changing in our society. 
Yeah, but then you find that also the girls, like my friends, we underwent the training together, but still some of them still went ahead and they were cut. You got the cut? Yeah, sure. Out of their own volition? Their own will. So, as I said, it really depends on yourself and your where you stand at. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's, that's quite serious. Yeah. Yeah. So, Naomi, what, um, what do you look for in evidence when, when you get an FGM case? Okay. Um, first, you know the investigations are done by the police. Yes. Even though sometimes, as, as prosecutors, we guide in, uh, yeah. in such um, investigations. Mm -hmm. But in not all cases where they need our assistance, sometimes. Mm -hmm they assigned a, a prosecutor to guide them. Mm -hmm. So when we, when I'm looking at the evidence I look for first, it depends on which offence um, which offence has been committed. Because as I said, the prohibition against the FGM Act, it, it has uh, many, many offences. Oh, so you look at the case and decide where whatever you've been brought to, where it falls? First I look at the statements mm -hmm. of the witnesses. Mm -hmm. You know, it can be even attempted. Yeah. It can be maybe procuring uh, FGM on yourself. It can be using derogatory or use of words. Oh, yes. It can be... There are so many offences under the, the Act. Yeah. So it will depend on which offence I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. For example, if it's using tools. Yeah. Or found in possession of uh, F, uh, tools used to conduct FGM or mm -hmm. to cut, then I look at the... Was there is there a connection between this tool and uh, somebody who has gone FGM or with uh, an offence of FGM? Mm -hmm. For example, if it's a knife which is alleged to have been used for to cut somebody, a girl or a woman, mm -hmm. then probably we look at the the DNA. We want the we we'll advise the police to match the DNA of the blood which was found mm -hmm. on that knife, even if it's years later. No, it, now depends it on the time again. It, it also depends. That's what I'm mm. saying. It's case to case. Mm. It will depend mm. on the circumstances. Mm. So there's so many evidence mm. you things you look at depending on the case. Yeah. But of course we look at the we look at the statements. First we love to look at the statements. Yeah. What evidence has the police? Maybe there's um, forensic evidence like now when we are that the offence of uh, being in possession of. Uh, tools or equipment used to perform FGM. Mm -hmm. Because in some cases you can, I can be found with, a, for example, a knife. That knife can be used to do other things. Yes. So you have to connect. Yeah. You can look at, um, we also have a P3 form. Maybe somebody was uh, going through FGM. Mm -hmm. That P3 form mm -hmm. is going to support or corroborate our evidence. Okay. All right. Yeah, we also have um, uh, expert evidence, like now the medical, the um, a medical practitioner coming to court to produce that history, also to testify. Mm. We have treatment notes yeah. if it's an uh, conducting of FGM. So it will depend on which case we have. Mm. So there's so many evidence. There's physical evidence. There's forensic evidence. What are some of the penalties? Again, it really depends. Depends, on like what's 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 like can just be three years. Okay. Somebody slapped three years. Uh -huh. uh, can pick another offense if you conduct FGM and then it results into somebody losing her life. Yes, it will. You are allowed Changes to change now. Life, yeah, life sentence. Okay, or serve a life sentence in prison. Oh, all right. Yes. Okay. Oh, quite quite interesting. So there are people watching us on Facebook. And um, um, Cop Vincent Lumumba has a complaint. He says our, our complaint is case poor, so maybe uh, Vincent will reach out to you after the show uh, mm -hmm. just to, to get to know what your complaint is all about. And then Collins Kodak says, um, FGM, thanks Collins for watching, and you owe me a visit to Kisumu, by the way. Mm -hmm. FGM is entrenched in culture, education, and the law alone cannot cure it. It's time we pursue safer cultural alternatives that do not infringe on people and individual rights. What do you say? Are they safer? I don't know that Collins is still saying there should be a cut, a safer cut. Is there anything like a safer cut in FGM? I don't think so. FGM is FGM. It's mutilation. Yeah, anything which mutilates the yes. the dental, the physical, the, the external uh, dental of yes. a, a lady, it, 
that include girls and women because you know we have girls and we have women who are even at 42 and that go FDM for me it's still yeah. FDM and it's prohibited yeah. it doesn't matter whether I consented to it that's why we charge even adults yes because your consent is immaterial ah so Collins, there is no safer cultural alternative, just a rite of passage, like mm -hmm. uh, the one Malawa says, Amref conducts. So uh, I don't think there is anything safer with FGM, it's all bad. Uh, Betty Akini, great conversations on FGM. Thank you so much for watching. Betty Mukana Mukabras, again, thank you. He watches from the diaspora. Uh, he was also logged in the last time. Uh, Kibiwata Santi Sana, he is listening and watching us from Kericho. And of course, uh, there is Bradley Ongota. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, so we, we will re we'll respond to your comments uh, on Facebook right after the show. And of course, you keep the conversation going. So maybe, Malawa, I want to ask, mm -hmm. um, so has, how, how long have we done this cricket? Uh, cricket? How, how, how long have we used cricket mm -hmm. as a tool to educate uh, the public about? Uh, since 2013. Okay. But now you don't get the whole, like, from 2013 yeah. up to now, yeah. because I'm still a student. So we do it during the holidays. So since 2013 up yeah. to now. Yeah. Yeah. So what if somebody comes and tells you, I have told my parents no, and mm -hmm. they're insisting. Is there a safe house? Okay, we don't, but we have connections. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. still we'll report the case to the police. To the police investigation. Yeah. 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 Does it become a problem when you say no, and then the police get involved, and then you have to go back home? <laughs> I'll tell you a short story. <laughs> I like stories. So yeah. there was this one time that a girl was being forced to undergo yeah. FGM in our village. Yes. So um, it was really against her will because she came and she came and reported to my brothers when the the first when there was no the Masai cricket ladies, yeah. when it was just the Masai cricket warriors. Mm -hmm. So they ca she came and reported the issue to my brother. Mm -hmm. So my brother instead reported to the police. police. So the police came and they were talking to the parents that no, this can't happen and so and so. Yeah. And uh, afterwards, um, the dad was hunting my brother down. Like oh. he wanted to spear my brother. Like it's a real oh, issue like happened yeah. a while ago. Yeah. So like, <laughs> so it became a different case again. It, dif it became a different case. So I hope the my brother was, was living in fear, yeah. but uh, eventually subsided. Is there political will to, to, to educate people against FGM? Are there political leaders in your area also involved. educating? Yeah, are they involved in this campaign? Okay, I wouldn't really say involved, yeah. but um, if there is any form of FGM that is being planned to happen in the community, mm -hmm. we just report to the chief and, and the, the chief and will the government. The government will really work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, Nomi, can I, can I, as a person in danger, call ODPP and say, I am in danger. I know uh, my parents are about to do this to me. Help me. Will the ODPP swing into action? Yes, we can. Yeah. Um, as, as I said, we have a specialist unit. Yes. We have vocal uh, point, people who to contact. Mm -hmm. That's why we have a specialist unit. Yeah. For example, if it's Nairobi, we do call. Uh, the in charge of the, the FGM unit, yeah. or you call the office you be referred to her. Yeah. She will make sure you she has report to the police. Mm -hmm. That is uh, maybe there's um, rescue centers yeah. to make sure you. So there are rescue centers. Uh, there are very few. Private owned or government owned? Private. Okay. Yes, okay. but uh, uh, in other counties they use schools because mm -hmm. you see FGM is also done during. Uh, school holidays yes mm -hmm. so they turn uh boarding schools into rescue, rescue centers. centers so these cats are rescued and taken to even though it's temporarily but yeah. it's it assists yeah. because it's to now get time to maybe arrest the perpetrators to try stop to stop the, the, function. The, the, the function yeah um there are so many ways to mechanisms of reporting you can you can also report to the police we can you can also report the children of us like now mm -hmm. if it's a child yes. we have child helpline um numbers we have nine nine for the police mm -hmm. we as she said some people report to the chiefs mm -hmm. so there's when so the government is present and very the clear. government is present yeah there's so many people you can report to yeah other than otp but even otp you can still call if you are able to and then they will have of course we refer the person with the right institution, maybe for investigations. Yes. If it's a case we need to uh, liaise with the police and the children officer so that this girl 
if it's a of course if it's a child then we rescue we must have to yeah. um uh, work with the children of us so that the child is placed properly under protection and care file is mm. opened for that child mm. the child is placed in a safe house or a children's home okay. but if it's at adults they are NGOs and uh, even sometimes as like I said schools are turned into and rescue, rescue centers, centers so they are rescued okay all right so we are winding up mm -hmm. Believe me, it's been an hour. <laughs> I know it doesn't feel like an hour. No, it doesn't. It's like we just started, uh, but we are winding up, and I want to thank you so much for your time today. And I think this FGM story, we can beat a story till the end of day yeah. because there are so many dimensions to it. But I don't know, do you see us? When do you see us? Do you ever see this whole uh, culture eradicated? It can, it can eradicate, yes, but it needs more time. You can't just, you know, culture, you can't like end, end it in a day or yeah, two. Yeah. So you can't say like 2022, as the government and the president is saying, mm -hmm. I still think that you need more time for the culture. Like, yeah. you know, you can't just end culture in a day. So yes, it will eradicate uh, in some time to come, yeah. but... Um, Okay. It needs a lot of initiatives and time. And time. And yeah. What do you think? Do you think we are going to eradicate this thing? I also believe that we we are going, but not uh, not now. Not for now. Yeah. Uh, you look at back at our history. Before 20, 2011, we didn't yeah. have an act like oh, yes. uh, which we. I think it's only the Children Act which provided for um, an offence. Yeah. But again, that was for the children, not about the adults. Now we have the the act. Yeah. Um, we have made a lot of steps. We have come from far. Yeah. So we we go with this. We as we are going, the, the, we have there are so many steps which have been taken by the government, mm -hmm. by uh, other and uh, governmental institutions yeah. and other like now UNFPA and yeah. other international like the the other international um, bodies. Yes. So I think we are making a lot of um, progress, and uh, God willing, maybe. No, it's, really. also, it's also <laughs> in our vision 2030. That's okay. uh, by 2030, we should also have eradicated yeah. FGM. Yeah. So probably maybe if tw in 2022 we are not able to eradicate FGM, <laughs> by 20 we are in 2022, <laughs> so we to we keep going. Yeah, maybe we'll by get 2030, somewhere. Yeah, we'll be done with it. Yeah, but we have made a lot of progress. Yeah. And it's a time when this FGM will be gone. Mm. Will be gone completely. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. We yeah. hope the millennials will pick up and kill it. Yeah, sure. We are depending on you now. Let's pray. The future is now. <laughs> the future is now. <laughs> yes, mm. yes. You're saying something. Sorry, I cut you off. No, I... I think I've made my point. Yeah. Mm. Maybe to comment about what you said yeah. about the brother who yes. was... Uh, you know that's how now the community, the hostility from the community, yeah. that's also now even a as an implication yeah. to, to us as uh, prosecutors. Yeah. That means that when somebody, you, you feel that if I report, mm -hmm. the, the, the community will come after me, you know to report. Yes. So we are poor reporting. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's one of the challenges yeah, that I wanted yeah, to I pick. But, but of course, we have uh, other mechanisms like witness protection. Yeah. We can we sometimes lie with the police. We, are, we make sure that those witnesses are protected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we have so many other uh, challenges as a okay. uh, office. Okay. I picked on that one because yeah, you yeah, mentioned yeah, it. Yeah. There's that hostility. That's okay. one of our, our challenges. Right. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. I have to close. Mm -hmm. Unless I'm going to get you to travel because of time. Mm -hmm. And definitely can tell these stories over and over again. Yeah, sure. Keep doing what you're doing. Uh, slowly change will be seen. The effects will be seen. Don't get tired. No, Help wouldn't. girls, yeah, mm -hmm. as you do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, thank you so much, everyone, who's been watching us on Facebook and engaging with us on YouTube. We are grateful that you took time to, to stay with us during this discussion. Our ladies have given us some very uh, good insights about, uh, about FGM. We are slowly winning it. It's not, we are not there yet, but you're getting there. And of course, FGM has no other definition except mutilation and it's outlawed in Kenya. There's no way around it. It is totally outlawed. So just stop it. Don't imagine it. Girls, like I say, are born beautiful. Girls are born whole. Let's stop trying to, to be, to be co-creators with God. I mean, let's just let God's creation be. Uh, the ODPP is doing a lot on this front. The SOPs are there to help standardize how they make the decision to charge on, on, uh, on FGM cases. Apparently, there are 22 hotspots in this country where FGM is still practiced. And it continues to be medicalized now. Now, there are medical practitioners practicing this thing. So we need to work together to stop this. Help the community. 
help the communities that are practicing this see the light, I believe. Let them stop doing this and find other ways of, of, of doing the rites of passage. And of course, you can't end this show without giving a big up to Malawa's <laughs> brothers. Everybody needs the four brothers. <laughs> Everybody needs brothers like Malawa's. They protected yeah. us. So protect the girls around you. And you'll see progress. You can see progress in Malawa. So mm -hmm. let's keep doing what you are doing. So thank you so much once again. It's the end of the show. If you watch us and, and want to ask something, definitely ask on the on the on the page on, on YouTube, on Facebook, or on Twitter, and you'll get the responses you need. If it is personal, you can inbox, slide for DM, and you'll get a response definitely from ODPP. So once again, have a good day, have a blessed Friday, have a good weekend, and let's catch up next week for the next discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you.